my screen is visible yes yeah so uh, good evening everyone so uh, i would really like to thank uh, professor sergil for his time because whenever i just mes message him he was really very uh, uh, kind enough to accept our invitation invitation for this talk so before just going to the talk let me just introduce our chapter members who have been actively involved uh, in this uh, 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 promotion of this chapter and the chapter activities that we uh, do recently so i am pallav kumar gogoi recently the chair of apmtt sbc with our vice chair as ms ananya de satya prakash as our secretary assistant secretary as gobind uh, treasurer as debolina debnath assistant treasurer as uh, suraj kumar singh webmaster as anuradha gupta assistant webmaster as tina aj Shreya Ghosh as our publicity coordinator, with our creative writer as Rajesh Vishen, and a regional coordinator of Anup uh, as a Anup Sharma. So we are very uh, proud to also announce that uh, we have been uh, doing lots of activities. And recently, in 2021, from the IEEE APMTTS chapter, we got this outstanding chapter award. And recently, we have been quite involved in uh, site-related activities where we are mostly uh, working on uh, teaching us, uh, like uh, establishing rural labs. at uh, regional school so this was our activity back in december 2020 where we have done our activity and for this award we also won the i uh, iee uh, derel chong student activity award for the activity that was conducted in 2022 where we are working on bridging the divide, uh, digital divide as our uh, motto says that like connecting ideas at a lightning speed so uh, so to know more about our chapter and our chapter activities uh, you could definitely uh, visit our website and also you can drop a mail to us and uh, i'm just sharing my website uh, address at uh, the chat and thank you that's all so without any further ado i would uh, like to uh, i would ask uh, shreya ghosh who's our publicity coordinator and actually she was the person behind the designing the poster actually creative poster that she used to design for our all uh, all of the talks uh, so i'd ask uh, ms shreya to kindly uh, inter, uh, give this uh, introduction introduce uh, professor segil uh, uh, today so uh, shreya thank you um so today we have dr sergey abadal uh, he received phd in computer architecture from the department of computer architecture uh, in barcelona tech upc previously he had obtained msc in information and communication technologies and bsc in telecommunication engineering from telecommunication engineering school UPC Barcelona Spain he had been uh, in a visiting researcher position in various prestigious places like broadband wireless networking lab georgia tech under the professor of ian akil dis then uh, university of illinois led by professor joseph torellas and uh, he visited dr lascos and dr Uh, Ion it is at fourth grid Greece. Currently, he works as a postdoc researcher at the Enthricad Group at the Computer Architecture Department of the ba uh, Barcelona Tech. He is the project coordinator of Wiplash Fet Open project and has participated in several national and EU projects. So we are looking forward to this talk, this event. So, Professor, kindly please start. Thank you very much. So let me share the screen again. Hopefully this will be working. So tell me when you see a, bit, a full screen. Uh, uh, yes, 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 it's full screen. Okay, fantastic. So let me prepare a little bit. Okay, great. So yeah, the talk today is gonna be uh, uh, entitled Towards the Internet of Everything with Reconfigurable Intelligent Surfaces and Graphene Antennas. The idea is that I motivate a little bit What is the Internet of Everything, and, and why this is happening, and how how is that important for communication engineers? And then I'm going to talk about two technologies which we think they are going to be very impactful in the following years, and which are the the different applications that these uh, technologies might have. One is reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. You might have heard about meta surfaces and intelligent surfaces as kind of a sort a sort of passive antennas that uh, can help to modify the wireless channel of many applications. And then graphene antennas is a bit more exotic, a bit more prospective, but it's these um, antennas that use this um, new 
type of uh, material to the material that has some specific properties at, ter at the terahertz band, which are very helpful for some of the applications that we're looking at. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that's, that's going to be more or less my my talk today. Uh, for those of you that uh, you don't know, you said the Puerto in Catalonia. This is uh, in Spain, in Barcelona, in Spain, home of a very nice architecture from Antonio Gaudí, like the Sagrada Familia. It's a very big church. It's very, uh, it's a very good visit if you ever come to Barcelona. Casa Batlló on the uh, at the bottom, which is another another very nice building by Antonio Gaudí, this architect. And then on the right, you can see the the Ramblas, which is a very nice promenade uh, uh, on the south uh, on the south of, of Barcelona, going right to the sea. So if you never visited Barcelona. Uh, do it, and if you ever come, just uh, tell me because we can prepare a visit. Uh, Universidad Politica de Catalonia is uh, on the outskirts of the city. It's a public university, which means that the, the, the uh, tuition fees are, are very low. Uh, this is a, Spain is not the, the United States, so the tuition fees are very low for public universities. UPC hosts over 30,000 students and has a strong focus on science and technology. So you have communication engineering, civil engineering, architecture, computer science, and so on and so forth. And it's hosting uh, many nice um, research groups and, and in schools, but also very nice uh, infrastructures like the Mare Nostrum, which is uh, uh, one of the best uh, supercomputers in Europe, which is, well, the, it's remarkable because it's hosted inside the chapel and it's kind of a very nice and uh, unique view. But, uh, well, uh, if you ever come to Barcelona, let us know. We can prepare a visit to the, to the university. We would be very glad to host you. So among all these very nice research groups and research centers that we have at UPC, you can find EntryCAT, the Nano Networking Center in Catalonia, which is the one that I'm happen, uh, I happen to work with. Right? And EntryCAT, uh, in short, uh, this research center has been created with the main goal of carrying fundamental research on nano networking. So, well, you might wonder what nano networking is, and that's a very good question because it's kind of a new word for us. Uh, nano networking has two has two definitions. One can be network communications and networking that happens at very short scales, going down to the nano scale, but it also could include micro scale or millimeter scale. But essentially, communications at very at very short ranges. And another uh, definition of nano networking could be communications and networking design, which is affected or impacted by nanotechnology, right? By the new the new avenues of research that nanotechnology enables with new materials, new processes, new technologies that can allow you to do new types of antennas, new types of communication networks, and, and new types of applications. So that's the main goal of, of Entrica. Okay, so as promised, let's go to the Internet of Everything. Let me try to motivate this talk and the technology that I'm going to present afterwards. Um, so... You being all a technical audience, I'm pretty sure or uh, almost sure that uh, you know about Moore's Law, which has been working for over 40 years and is essentially was telling, uh, this was coined by, by Gordon Moore at Intel, and essentially this is telling you that the, the number of uh, transistors that you can put in the same uh, square millimeter or in the same chip area is going to be is going to be doubling every 18 months. So... That has been a very uh, known law that has been going on for uh, almost 40 years and has been yeah, accomplished for over these 40 years. And that's the main, the main driving force behind uh, the evolution of processors and, 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 and uh, chips and processors and, and computers going from very simple things to very complex uh, cell phones and laptops and desktops that you have nowadays. So this is a very well-known uh, a very well-known uh, law for scaling computing, but a less, a less known law that is perhaps more relevant to the talk today is the at homes law of bandwidth, which is very similar than Moore's law, but instead of telling you how many transistors you're going you're to have in, the, in a given chip area, what at homes law of bandwidth is telling you is that every 18 months we will be, we will be needing to double the speed of wired and wireless communication networks. Essentially, uh, due to new technologies appearing, the, due to computers being uh, faster and new uh, uh, new uh, capabilities uh, required, the, the outcomes law of bandwidth predicted uh, back in the day, back in the 90s, that the speed of wired and wireless communications should be doubling every 18 months in a similar rate than the most law was predicting for computing. Right? And this has been pretty much uh, fulfilled over the past two decades and a half 
going from the very beginnings of uh, cellular compute, uh, cellular networks and, and Wi-Fi networks to the Wi-Fi networks that we have today. And uh, yeah, as I was saying, why do we have to comply with Eltham's law, law of bandwidth? First of all, because there's a widespread adoption of new technologies and computing. Uh, computing is surrounding us in a way that hasn't been done before. Uh, as a one of the side effects of this is that we have an explosive growth of data and content. Everyone uh, nowadays can take pictures and upload it into the internet, use social media uh, anytime, anywhere. And that creates, well, a lot of demand for communications. And uh, the idea is, okay, so at home laws of bandwidth, it's telling us that we need to double the speed every 18 months. But how do we keep the pace set by this law? Well, we can, as a communication engineer, uh, I can think of a few th things that we can do to, to, to increase the speed of, of communication networks over the years. One would be to increase the spectral efficiency of our wireless communication networks with uh, more complex modulation. So going from the typical on-off keying or BPSK, which is essentially putting one bit of data, per, one bit per second of data per hertz of bandwidth, you go to more uh, more efficient or more spectrally efficient uh, uh, te modulation techniques like QPSK, 16PSK, uh, 64QPSK. 64 64 uh, so in the end, adding more bits per second in each hertz of bandwidth of your communication system. That's one way in which you can keep increasing the, the speed of, of, of our communications. Another way to increase the communication speed, if you fix the modulation, then you might want to go faster by increasing the bandwidth of your communication system, right? So uh, if your antenna has double the bandwidth, with, a, with the same modulation, you can put double the the bits per second, let's say, right? So, well, you can you can improve the modulation and improve the bandwidth, uh, but improving the bandwidth is not always yeah for free. Uh, you need some spectrum to allocate that bandwidth, and that's yeah you know that the the spectrum is very scarce and very competed. So we cannot always increase the bandwidth of our systems. So what uh, let's say the community uh, and industry is pushing for is to do another thing. Uh, which instead of being uh, doing wideband antennas and transceivers is to increase the frequency, right? So um, the idea is that if you cannot increase the bandwidth because uh, of spectral resolutions or whatever, and the modulation cannot be uh, made more complex, then you can increase the frequency. When you increase the frequency of, of operation of the wireless communication network, then uh, roughly an antenna, which has the same, uh, uh, more or less a similar... Uh, uh, resonance profile uh, at lower frequencies. When you go to a higher frequency, you keep having a, a similar uh, relative bandwidth, which means that the absolute bandwidth of your antenna is going to be increasing. So that's going to give you more space for putting more bits per second via this increase of bandwidth and, 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 and modulating the signals uh, at, at, a, at, a given, at a given modulation, right? So what we have is that this picture that I showed before, when I'm trying to put, uh, where, where you look at the different technologies that have been used over the years, and you look at the frequency at which, at which they have been working on, you would not be surprised that this has gone from uh, the typical 2.4 gigahertz or lower frequencies for uh, 3G and, and GPRS and GSM at the, uh, on the early days to 5 gigahertz and 3.5 uh, of uh, new generations to the, well, not uh, the, the already deployed, being deployed uh, bands at 60 gigahertz and 28 gigahertz. 60 gigahertz, we already had, there are already uh, routers, Wi Fi routers in the market that work at 60 gigahertz. And 5G is already deploying antennas and base stations at 20, 28 gigahertz for, for this reason that I was saying that we need more, more bandwidth, so we need to go to higher frequencies. But what, uh, what we see as academics uh, that we try to, to predict a little bit the future, what we see is that this trend is continuing and it's not going to stop today. And if you start looking at 6G and uh, next generations of, uh, of uh, wireless communications, you see that everything is going towards the terahertz band. So essentially we're going to an even higher uh, frequency band. We have an even higher um, a bandwidth so that we can fit more bits per second into the wireless spectrum, right? 
So, yeah, that's uh, giving us the opportunity to go to the Internet of Everything, in which everything is connected, everything is connected at very high speeds, right? So having a higher bandwidth, having a higher speed, higher capacity of wireless communications allows allow us to go at higher speeds and also uh, connect more things at the same time. You have a, you have a higher connection that density of devices per, let's say, meter square, right? So that means that we can go to other paradigms like... Uh, 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 wireless virtual reality, wireless augmented reality. We can keep pushing in the Internet of Things. We can have things like wireless computing in which chips of a, of a computing system can be communicating also wirelessly, also in a data center. So, yeah, we're going to novel paradigms in which everything is connected, everything is connected to the Internet or device-to-device -device connection through wireless communication. So... Uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing that everything is connected. We're, we're going to go at very high speeds and everything can be connected. But uh, a side effect of having uh, uh, technologies working towards the terahertz band to have this higher bandwidth, there's this side effect which no one actually notices, or, well, some people notice, but uh, generally less less uh, debated, which is that since we have to work at higher frequencies, this means that the passives that we use for the transceivers and antennas, they are going to become smaller. That means that the inductors, the capacitors, the antennas, and other passives that you use in your uh, RF circuits, they are going to be downscaling uh, in, in size. And this shows, for instance, when you go to higher frequencies, which is the size of an inductor uh, at that frequency, and then in, in the torch, you can see which is the technology that allows you to go to that frequency. So you, you see that if you go to 22 nanometer in CMOS, you can have an Fmax of around 400 gigahertz, which means that the inductor at that frequency is going to be occupying like 100 micrometer square, which is very small, especially when you compare it to lower frequencies like the one in the reference, which is, yeah, uh, 25 times uh, higher, right? And that also applies to the antennas, right? The antenna, which is the most fundamental uh, device that you use in wireless communications, the the higher the frequency, the lower the the resonance uh, the, the resonance condition, the lower the the, length, the resonant length of the antenna. So if you pick a, a dipole and you move it higher and higher in the frequency, you will see that the length of a, of that dipole is going to be lower and lower and lower, going below one millimeter of length, right? So yeah, that means that you can start to you can start uh, to integrate these antennas on a chip, right? The typical dimensions of a chip is 28 by 20 millimeters. So very early you start to have uh, a size compatible with on-chip integration um, for your antennas, which is very beneficial, right? So if you integrate everything within the same chip, the, the digital, the analog, and the antenna, uh, well, you, you have very high performance. And yeah, that's not something that I'm saying. It's something that the industry is already using. For uh, for many things, and I'm showing this, which is this slide is like f uh, from a paper which is already more than than ten years old, showing a sixty gigahertz antenna uh, integrated on chip. You, here uh, on the bottom right, you see the typical structure of a chip with a with a thick uh, bulk silicon layer, and then a silicon dioxide where the where the transistors reside, and then uh, a, a bigger silicon, di well, thicker silicon dioxide, which is still very thin, in which the metallization layers of the chip uh, reside. So the idea is to use some of these metallization layers to build uh, an actual metallic antenna, which is integrated within within the chip. So at 60, you have an, uh, uh, antennas which are smaller than one millimeter. So very easy, very easy, very easy to to integrate that uh, on chip. And not only that, right? So besides of an antenna, you need a transceiver to feed the antenna. Uh, but at higher frequencies, you can you can have uh, very small transceivers that can feed on a chip and can go to a very high, very high speed. Like this is the case of one uh, design presented like already seven years ago uh, with a not a very super fancy technology. This is 65 nanometer CMOS. It's a prototype that was working at 240 gigahertz. Uh, modulating things at QPSK at 16 gigabits per second, taking less than two millimeters square, including the antenna, this uh, loop here that you see here is the antenna for this transceiver, consuming uh, not a lot of power, 220 milliwatts of power with uh, an effective isotropic radiation radiated power of one dBm. So very, very functional uh, transceiver, which is integrated on chip for communication uh, to go outside of the chip. But the bottom line of all this is that you can have antennas and transceivers already integrated on chip, uh, operated at very high speeds. So, 
if you take this, right, the idea, if you take it to the extreme, you can start considering to have very, very, very small devices that can pack a sensor, a very small processor, a very small antenna, and a very, a very small transceiver. And I'm showing this example, even if it's at 200, to, to the 2.4 gigahertz, I'm showing this example because this is a device which is less than one centimeter, uh, a cubic cent less than one cubic centimeter. And if you take a look to the, the to the to the different parts of this device, there's a lot of things that you don't need in a in a in a nano device, right? You, there's there's a, a a voltage regulator which is very big and you can remove. You have a very large flash memory. You can have uh, there's different parts that you can actually remove. And if you just focus on the antenna and the transceiver and a very small processor that it's beside beside it and the sensor. You will see that you're going to less and less and less space uh, in that device. And if you take it to the terahertz band, you will see that the antenna and the transceiver is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So that you can start considering to put things into capsules and putting that, ingesting that into your body and to have uh, new applications in the, for the intravenous in nanometers, for instance, in which things are inside your body and they are so small that they can still be inside your body and not be rejected by your by, by, by the by your system by your uh, uh, health system and, and and enable new applications of sensing of communications within the body to detect tumors to detect uh, different different diseases with a very nice uh, precision right so yeah that's what i'm saying we can start of uh, we can start considering that everything can be connected not necessarily to the internet but that everything can have a wireless connection to other devices or to the internet, right? Mm -hmm. And this opens the door to very nice and fancy new applications that we couldn't consider before because of, of uh, size constraints. One of these, which are I am very interested on, is on-chip communication, in which you communicate different parts of a, of a computing system from chip to chip or within the chip of a computing system. We use several antennas in, that, in, in those chips to communicate within the, the computing system. Another application, like I was saying before, you can consider, start considering in-body communication in which you could have devices in your gastrointestinal tract or in your blood system running around your, 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 your body. And, well, if you pack a sensor, an antenna, and a transmitter, then you can sense things very close to where they are happening. Like if you have a tumor, you can sense biomarkers very close where they, they are released and use the antenna to communicate that detection of a of a tumor from the inside to the outside of the body, and then to your doctor that can tell you you should you should come and and, and have a, a routine scan. And other applications that might happen. Uh, this is very fancy. It's called intelligent materials or uh, claytronics. Uh, some people call it claytronics, uh, in which you would have uh, actuators and antennas within uh, the parts of different materials, right and by being able to sense the the surroundings and actuating, you should be able to wirelessly uh, change the shape of uh, a material, change the color, change the the yeah uh, the, the different uh, physical properties of the material by just having these actuators and these antennas, which are very small, and they can be integrated within actually within the material. So, very very new and fancy applications and. What I want to show in this slide, without going into too much detail, is that yes, uh, by by allowing uh, everything to be connected, right? These new applications uh, uh, arise with many different uh, requirements in terms of size, density, latency, throughput, reliability, and so on and so forth. Very different among them. Very appealing. Very very very. Uh, um, leveraging the fact that we go to the terahertz band and that the antennas are very small, right? But all these applications, in the end, what we are, what we are saying is that uh, to enable them, uh, um, we see that we need very miniaturized and versatile wireless communication systems. But what I wanted to come to say is that the Internet of Everything is a very nice concept, which is enabled by the fact that we're going to the terahertz band and that we can uh, connect things with, with small antennas and high, uh, high speeds, but indeed, if we want to actually um, uh, realize those applications, we will need to go to very, uh, uh, well, design novel, miniaturized, and versatile wireless communication systems, including the antennas and including the transceivers. And that's what uh, we're trying to, to talk about today, right? How we can make our communication systems, wireless communication systems, much more versatile and much more miniaturized. So that's, that's what we're going to talk today. So let me... 
quickly go through this first uh, technology that we wanted to talk today. The first application that we wanted to, well, the first technology that we wanted to discuss today is reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. And the title of this section is uh, called uh, Reshaping Our Wireless World with These Reconfigurable Intelligent Surfaces. And there's a reason behind this title that I, we're going to uh, talk about now. So let me go back to the ad hoc of bandwidth that we, yeah, we're going to the Trahertz band to try to keep pace with this law over the next uh, decades, right? But Going to higher frequencies, especially when we go to the terahertz band, is not for free. This bandwidth that comes with a higher frequency, it's not for free. So if you take a look to the typical uh, freeze uh, freeze equation for the for uh, channel losses, right? You will see that the uh, received power is equal to the transmitted power and uh, multiplied by the gains of the antennas, and then this term here, which uh, it's telling you about the free space path laws, right, that depends on the inverse of the frequency and the distance. Of course, this is assuming resonant antennas at, at both ends, right? So this is a simplification of what's actually happening in your systems, but you see very nice trend, right? So the, the, long, the longer is the link, the more losses, right? Uh, that's why you are dividing by this D, capital D, which is the distance. Uh, in principle, the higher the frequency, the higher the losses, because the antennas actually are getting smaller because of this resonance condition. Right, and so if you want to counteract that, uh, counteract the higher uh, losses of higher uh, speeds and uh, sorry, higher distances and higher frequencies, what you need to do is to increase the gain of your antennas. Right, so either make arrays, uh, MIMO systems, and so on, things that uh, allow you to increase the gain of the of the transmitter and the receiver. Right. Um, so that's one. When you increase the frequency, automatically you you have to start doing extra things to to counteract the, the higher losses that you're going to have on the channel. And then when you start going to the frequent to the terahertz frequencies, what you see on the picture on the on the center of the screen is that you start having some undesired effects which are called molecular absorption. So if you see the different lines tell you which is the path loss as a function of the frequency at different distances. So the blue is at one meter, the green is at uh, five meters, uh, red, uh, well, pink and yeah, and pink and uh, um, brown at 10 and 30 meters, right? Uh, and what you see is that you start having some peaks, right? You see this peak at zero dot, let's say 55 terahertz. You start having peaks which in which the pathos goes, goes, goes really, really, really high, which they are called molecular absorption peaks, right? Uh, the molecules in our environment, they have a size which resonates a terahertz band, at the terahertz band. So depending on the composition of the air or the uh, environment in which you're going to transmit, right, uh, you have to expect some of these uh, peaks to happen in your attenuation. So your channel is uh, not flat anymore, so you start having this problem of, of uh, higher path loss in free space and also having these peaks of molecular absorption. So going to a terahertz band, yeah, it's not for free, right? Um, so, yeah, actually, what this means is the higher spreading losses, which uh, we were telling, uh, telling, telling now, molecular absorption, and another thing that I didn't mention is that everything can be a blocking element. When you go to the terahertz band, your body starts to be a, a, a problem for the electromagnetic waves. So, um, the let's say the radiation, terahertz radiation, which is uh, quite weak generally, cannot go through your body. So... If you're blocking the path of the electromagnetic waves, maybe your reception is going to be very, very, very weak. So that means that due to blockers, due to molecular absorption, and due to, due to the spreading losses, you're going to probably have a very short range if you don't do anything, right? So going to higher bands, terahertz band, it's very nice, but uh, this high bandwidth, it's not for free. It's going to result in a very short range. So you have a distance problem, right? You have a distance problem because you cannot transmit at the distances you, that you would like to have, right? And what what has been proposed to alleviate that problem is to try to not be, to try to see the channel not as your enemy because you're, it's giving you these losses and these problems, but rather try, try to take advantage of the channel, try to take advantage of the environment to try to, to make these signals to arrive to the receiver. And how you do that? You do that with programmable wireless environments, which is a topic which has been exploding in the last few years, which is now imagine that you have a way to control the direction of reflections, which generally are specular and you cannot control, right? Imagine that you can, you, can, you can do that. Imagine that you can coordinate multiple reflections so that they can add constructively at the receiver. 
imagine that you can block harmful signals that uh, will not be uh, that will be interfering in the, at your receiver. Imagine that you can do something to collimate the beams that that are spreading over the channel, right? And that would be fantastic. That would mean that the, that the channel that is uh, giving you all those losses in, in principle is going to be much better, and that you would be uh, not so, well, no, not solving but relieving this distance problem. Right? But, okay, that's a very far, that's a very nice very nice idea. What do I need to do to create this programmable wireless environment? Well, you need uh, programmable reflectors essentially, right? Um, so you need reflectors that are, that are able to. Yeah, do all these things to modify the direction of the reflection, to allow, to collimate the beams, to block signals which are interfering, and so on and so forth. So, well, mm, there has been people that has been working in this concept of of programmable reflectors, and they have given many names to that concept, which is some of them can be as follows: large intelligent surfaces, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, intelligent reflective surfaces, software-defined metamaterials, hypersurfaces. These are uh, many names that have been given to the same concept, essentially a reflector which is programmable and that you can add some intelligence to help you in this uh, quest to giving, uh, to relaying the signals from the transmitter to the receiver, avoiding the problems of the terahertz communications uh, communication systems. Right? And yeah, the idea is that all these concepts are reflectors with some intelligence, as I was saying, but not not normal reflectors. So ref Conventional reflector is might work, but uh, there's a, a technology that is going to be much better for this kind of, of, of idea, which is called metasurfaces. I'm pretty sure that you are familiar with metasurfaces, but if not, here's a quick tutorial. So metasurfaces are generally planar structures composed of arrays of sub-wavelength elements, unit cells, that enable a presidential control of electromagnetic waves. So essentially what these metasurfaces are is just a very compact array of antennas, right? And and generally, passive arrays of antennas, which means that uh, there's no no active element that is going to be rotating, but rather that you're going to control the transmission or the reflection of the signals of the electromagnetic waves that go that impinge on these metasurfaces. And metasurfaces are kind of a particularization of the concept of metamaterials, which are not planar, but in the end are uh, uh, structures composed of arrays of sub wavelength sub- elements. And the idea is this: that the elements that are used in this in these metasurfaces are sub-wavelength in nature, which means that they are much, much smaller than the wavelength of the of the, of the the wave that you are trying to, to dominate, right? And, yeah, uh, metasurfaces allow to do many things to the impinging wave, uh, mainly three. I can summarize that into three. You can control the absorption that this material is giving to the uh, uh, to the uh, wave that it's impinging, so you can actually absorb everything that it impinges into a into a a metasurface or part of it, or just waves coming from a from a given angle. So it depends uh, on what you want to do. So that's one absorption. The second one is to control the direction of reflection, so anomalous reflection. This is. Okay, a normal uh, surface would specularly reflect the signals that are impinging, but with a meta surface, I can control the the direction of the reflection. Okay, I can point the beam, the reflected beam, to a direction which not which would not be natural, right? Uh, that's something that we can do with a meta surface. And finally, the third thing that we can do with a meta surface is to control the scattering of the reflection. So you can have a wave which is planar, and when you reflect it, you can you can have an arbitrary away from it. it can be in a scattering it can be random it can be a spherical it can be any other type of of, of a scattering so you, with the control of absorption uh, reflection and, and scattering you can have very nice features that allow you to have very nice applications for instance the absorption can allow you to have uh, better uh, solar solar power cells in which uh, you can absorb the light from the sun no matter which is the angle of incidence that can be one one of the applications another one is for uh, medical imaging in which you might want to reduce the uh, the internal interference of the of the system so you might add uh, absorbers that can help you have a, a higher contrast in the imaging of of uh, x-rays and so on uh, when you change the angle of incidence or uh, the angle of reflection this can have very very nice implications in radar to avoid being detected or to uh, yeah to increase detectability if you have a radar that is intelligently reflecting the the signals 
or it has a very nice application in, in, <coughs> in wireless communications because it allows you to, to have much better uh, beam steering uh, devices. And the, on the other hand, if you are controlling the, the, the scattering, you can have very nice applications like holography in which you are constructively adding uh, the waves at a given distance from the from the metasurface in a way that you see it as a hologram. That can be a very nice application of of uh, scattering control. And finally, also for uh, yeah, uh, low observability, uh, random scattering or rather cross section uh, reduction. It's a very nice application of metasurface. You can have random scattering no matter what what is the wave that is coming to the to the to the device, right? So you can have very nice low observability. Of the reflected wave, right? So if you take all of this and you uh, and you think of possible applications uh, in wireless communications in six G and beyond, well, that's not me. You can think of many that you, you can think of many applications and in wireless communications and and if you take a look at Google Scholar and you look at intelligent reflectors or reflectable intelligent surfaces, you will you will already see hundreds of papers working on different ideas like hybrid recording design index modulation, target tracking, indoor signal focusing, uh, unmanned area vehicle communications, indoor beaming for virtual reality applications, weighted sound rain maximization, energy efficient multi-user MISO, RCS reduction, wireless power transfer, joint encoding, joint testing and communications, two-way communications, signal performance, imaginary localization. So many, many, many different applications that can uh, exploit this reconfigurable intelligent surface uh, design to actually improve wireless communication systems, right? But of course, you cannot do that by simply having very nice reflectors because you need something first to tune the response of the reflector, depending on which is the uh, angle of incidence or which is the application that you want to 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 serve, and second to have some intelligence to be, so that these reflectors can be uh, able to uh, react in real time, uh, give give uh, uh, give uh, service to these different applications uh, actually they can optimize something uh, that they can be uh, for instance if you deploy some reflectors in a in a room which is unknown to the reflector uh, if you put intelligence into the reflector there can be some sort of phase in which there's uh, some testing of the of the environment there's some pilot that are sent uh, around and and the reflector can actually optimize itself for giving service to that particular room, right? So that's that's the idea. If you add reflectors and you add intelligence to to these reflectors, then then this idea becomes very 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 appealing for wireless communication systems. But but how do you do that, right? How do you implement that intelligence uh, to the meta service, right? T to that, uh, let me just very quickly explain uh, which has been the the um, the evolution of meta surface. Uh, in the last five to ten years, metasurface started be, uh, started being uh, static single function designs in which the unit cells were static and pre-designed for a particular application. For let's say, let's imagine, right? They were designed for uh, for absorbing uh, waves at a given frequency uh, coming with a given uh, angle, right? So that would be your metasurface, and that was a static, right? So if the frequency changed. Uh, nothing happened, right? Uh, you, the metasurface stopped working, or if the angle of incidence changed, then your metasurface stop, stopped working as as intended, right? So that had some value, but not a lot of value for the for the research community. So what people started doing is to integrate tuning elements within the unit cells of a metasurface, and this can be happening at microwave, at millimeter waves, or at, at terahertz band. So to integrate tuning elements within the metasurface, so that somehow you can start considering to change the the how the how the metasurface responds to different angles of incidence. So if the angle of incidence of the wave changes, you can tune the unit cell so that the absorption, let's say, uh, keeps working as uh, as intended. Or you can also consider that if the frequency of operation of the waves uh, changes, then you can tune the 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 cell so that the frequency response changes. And still, whenever there's a shift of frequency, your metasurface is still acts as, as intended, right? So that can be, and that was a very nice step, right? 
but we needed still one one other step, right? Once you have these tunable cells, you have these tunable elements within the unit cells of a metasurface, you need something to control and to give this intelligence to the to the tunable metasurface. So the third generation of these metasurfaces has started becoming programmable, multifunctional, externally and digitally controlled, right? So this is an example from 2014 in which uh, people had this uh, 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 metasurface working at microwave frequencies and they they integrated pin diodes to to the elements of the to the unit cells of the metasurface and on the back plane they they connected an, an FPGA a reconfigurable computer that in the end was controlling all these uh, pin diodes right so whenever whenever and the, this FPGA was was connected to a computer so whenever you wanted to change the the angle of incidence of of operation of this metasurface then you had some computer in which you could reprogram the FPGA so that it could affect the pin diodes and the, and this the operation of the of the metasurface would change in a programmable way okay so okay that was kind of a, a very long introduction of what's going on in the state of the art and I, now I would like to talk a little bit about what we did as entricad in this in this in this uh, in this field of uh, intelligent surfaces. So what we have done, we have focused on exploring the limits of programmable metasurfaces. So we wanted to take this idea of having an FPGA behind of the metasurface and take it to the next level, right? What we wanted is to investigate scalability. So what happens if your metasurface is bigger? Uh, if the frequency goes to higher frequencies, right? So if our metasurface needs to operate at the highest band. What would happen or how we can implement the space-time reconfigurability, which, uh, which applications would come out of it. Um, how we can implement multifunctionality, so not only absorption, but also reflection and also scattering control, right? What about having interconnectivity and modularity? What, we, what can we do to take a reconfigurable intelligent surface, connect it to another one to make a bigger panel or to connect them wirelessly to have uh, different uh, panels at different parts of the room so that they can interact and have a joint optimization to implement learnability. How can we make the intelligent surfaces to actually learn or think by themselves? And how we can implement resilient metasurfaces, which means that uh, uh, what happens if we break a, uh, a part of the metasurface, we can still work with it. We, what happens to this, to this system? And finally, how can we achieve ultra low power or perpetual operations? So the idea of this is that if you have an FPGA, that FPGA is going to be consuming power to do the reconfigurations, right? If that power is very high, then it's, very, it's going to be very hard to deploy these intelligent surfaces and then to operate them because you will have to, need to, to plug them into the power system or you will need to have batteries that will need to, will need to be replaced. So we were looking at how can we make this ultra low power and with perpetual operation, right? So we, we went from this uh, programmable and externally controlled metasurfaces to the concept of hypersurface, which is programmable, but it's also autonomous, intelligent, and interconnectable. And how we thought that this could be implementable was, would be by integrating control and communications within the metasurface, right? So what we, were, what we would be doing is to actually integrate chips, program, programmable chips, that would be connected to the tuning elements, right? And that would connect it to the external world, but in a much more integrated way than the, an FPGA, which might be uh, consuming much less power and in the end implementing some sort of uh, uh, intelligence within the metasurface, right? That's the idea that we implemented in the Biosoft project, it is a European project. Essentially, you see on the, on the center of the screen, you see a metasurface, all these uh, yellow patches are the unit cells, the, the tuning elements, that uh, the elements that actually implement the, the, the metasurface operation. Uh, below, uh, you see another layer with, uh, with diodes, this black layer with, with this green and black layer. And these diodes on the back side, they are uh, connected to a chip. They connected each, uh, each four of these uh, elements are connected to a single chip, which you can see on the bottom right which is in, in, uh, in turn interconnected with the other chips at the metasurface. And that's what's implementing the intelligence, right? The, they are pro chips that are programmable and they are, they, they are uh, reconfiguring the, the metasurface. All of these elements are in turn connected to a gateway controller, which is 
uh, responsible for connecting with the external world. So if you have a computer, a wireless, com uh, a cell phone, you could you you would be able to connect to this gateway controller, which in turn would send primitives to these uh, internal chips that would actually reconfigure the meta surface, the meta surface. And thanks to that, by closing the loop, we would have an intelligent, pro intelligent programmable and uh, a meta surface that actually reacts to the environment. And what's more, since we have this gateway controller, this gateway controller should be able to connect to other gateway controllers of the of other hypersurface, which means that in a, if in a room you have five hypersurfaces, which are not necessarily one next to each other, you could in, you could interconnect these uh, hypersurfaces to have some joint optimization of the channel or some uh, yeah different different application for those hypersurfaces, right? So yes, what we this was what we proposed, right? To have this uh, integrated uh, communication and control within the within the meta surface, but this potential also poses multiple uh, outstanding questions, like how large should the hypersurface be for a particular application? How do failures affect the hypersurface when when they are in operation? And how fast should these internal chips be? Right? These are three questions that we were trying to to solve during this project, and this is what we did, right? Uh, what we did is to create a semi-analytical framework of a metasurface with uh, uh, a unit cell performance model that related uh, the, the unit cell with the amplitude polarization, uh, directivity, and frequency at which the unit, cell, the unit cells sh should work. And with this model, we were telling which would be the amplitude and phase of the reflection of a, of a particular metasurface. Then that was plugged into a metasurface model, which takes all these unit cell responses and it creates the collective response of the metasurface at large. And this, after having the metasurface model, we had a third step, which is the metasurface coding, which is which states should be applied to each of the unit cells to create a given functionality, uh, let it be steering, focusing, absorption, and so on, which are the states that we should be putting into each of the unit cells. And once we have this metasurface uh, coded, then we extract uh, performance metrics out of the metasurface, which is already coded. So with this uh, framework, we wanted to study the scalability, the error analysis, and how fast should the, the internal chips be to sustain the, this idea, right? So yeah, th those are the three things that we did. We, uh, we tried to uh, perform a scalability analysis to dimension the metasurface as functions of the particular application at hand and its specifications. And in this case, well, what we what we did is to repeat the semi-analytical framework that we were using, uh, repeat it for many different sizes of the unit cells and also sizes of the metasurface, also for different numbers of states per unit cell, which means that if you have two states, you can only have a phase of 0 and 1 and 180. If you have four states, you can have 0, 90, 180, and 270, and so on and so forth. And essentially, we started studying, for instance, this is for web steering. So which is the directivity of a given metasurface? Which is the deviation of the of the, being, of the beam with respect to the targeted steering angle? And we, started, we, we repeated that analysis for many different uh, uh, metasurfaces. So in these figures, each of the points is a single metasurface with a, with a given uh, size of a unit cell, which is in the x-axis and a given size of the metasurface, which is in the y-axis, right? And, well, with this, we, we just gave, gave guidelines of design of these metasurfaces, right? So if your directivity has to be, let's say, 15 dBi, right, which is this yellow yellow line, then you would go for the biggest unit cell size and the smallest uh, metasurface size that is giving you that, that, that directivity to reduce scopes, right? And the same with the deviation. We saw that the deviation, for instance, is less affected by the size of the unit cell, but rather is more affected by the by the size of the metasurface at large, which is which means this blue area that goes on the on the upper part of this of this plot scale. So that's what we did to to see how this metasurface would scale as a function of the size of the of the unit cells on the metasurface. So another thing that we did is to quantify the impact of errors or the of power gating the different chips of the unit cells to 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 see. Uh, which would be the performance degradation of these of these devices? We came up with different uh, error models, uh, telling uh, which is the effect of one error and how they are spatially distributed. 
And what we saw is that different, different distributions of the errors would be impacting differently on, on a given application. For instance, in this case, we have a cluster of errors in the middle of the meta surface. And when the, when the size of this cluster is 30% of the entire meta surface, we see that the that the, the the beam that we wanted to steer at a given particular di uh, direction starts to have very large side load, right? And when you go to 45%, then the functionality is almost lost. But if the position of the different errors is independent uh, uh, from each other, so they are uh, uh, kind of independently distributed over the meta surface, you will see that even with the 45% of errors, the, the meta surface is still uh, acting as, as intended. So we saw that uh, we can power down uh, lots of uh, unit cells and still have a very nice response. And finally, to dimension the underlying configuration chips, we, we, we just wanted to see on the different applications how much data these chips should be processing to still have the actual application that, that we want. Right? So we took a meta surface with a given size and we modeled the controller network within, within the meta surface and we started considering different applications. In this case, for instance, we have this person which is moving across the room with a given speed, right? And the meta surface is going to track that 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 uh, that person by changing the angle of of reflection. So we calculated how many times we should change the angle of reflection so this person can still be tracked correctly, and we we translated that movement into number of number of primitives that should be, that should be sent to the internal chips. So the speed at which the chips should be able to, to react to, to external stimuli. And we did that for very simple, simple scenarios and a bit more complex scenarios in which a person is moving from one end of, uh, of this map to another end of this map. And we have, for instance, five hypersurfaces. And well, we analyze how many, how many bits per second they should be able to process to still track this user over the over different application. Uh, and even with this, we, we, we still have very uh, a, a list of open challenges, like how do we share the hypersurfaces among multiple users? How do we orchestrate these hypersurfaces for large problems? How can we make the hypersurface autonomous and perpetual thanks to energy harvesting? Or how can we apply machine learning to uh, make these hypersurfaces adaptive to multiple functionalities? These are some of the challenges that we still haven't resolved, but that would would be very nice research questions to 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 discover. Well, now let me go to the second technology that I wanted to talk about. So we have talked about reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, which allow us to shape the the to, to change the shape of the wireless channel that is actually impairing our communication in the Dreher's band and to convert it into something which is actually usable for the Dreher's band communication so that we can have, we can have wireless communications everywhere uh, with high performance. But now, let me go to the, let me reinforce the miniaturization thing of, of, uh, of today, right? So there are new applications within the chips, wireless communication within the chips, wireless communications within the body, which require very small antennas. And we wanted to to, to talk about graphene antennas, which are some a possible enabler of, of these applications. So, as I was saying, there are different applications which require very small antennas, right? But you know that downscaling antennas is not straightforward. Well, it's you can do it, right? It's straightforward in the sense that you can make a, always a smaller antennas, but when you reduce the size of the antenna, you are increasing the uh, resonance frequency, right? So if you take a gold antenna like you see on the on this uh, on this uh, uh, picture on the left, and you make it smaller and smaller and smaller, as you see on this plot on the right, in which the x-axis is the length of the antenna and the y-axis the resonance frequency, if you try to go to antennas which are let's say 10 micrometers in length, you start having frequencies which are closer to 10 terahertz, right? And if you start going to one micrometer in length of the antenna, you start having antennas which are on, a, on the scale of 100 terahertz. The problem is that this is not, this is not RF anymore. This becomes the optical optical antennas, which have some, so they have different impairments, different problems. And one of them is that there are no transceivers that can work at such high frequency without, without being actually optical, right? So the idea is that you become optical and you have, you have a low range and uh, some problems arise, right? So the idea is, 
how can we make an antenna close to 10 micrometers or one micrometer and still uh, radiate into frequencies which are, are, are still considered RF? Well, that's with thanks to graphene. Graphene, this is ma this material which had been theorized, theorized more than 50 or well, more than 70 years ago, but uh, it wasn't until 200, 2004 in which pro professors Game and Novoselov uh, actually uh, were able to isolate graphene for the first time and prove the physical properties of this material. The, one of the, the, the main particularity of graphene is that it's the first uh, discovered or this, the first isolated 2D nanomaterial. It's a material that has only one atom uh, of thickness, so it's considered to, uh, two dimensional because the, the, it has, it doesn't have thickness, right? And well, just for you to know how important this is uh, for physicists, uh, Game and Novoselov uh, won the Nobel Prize in Physics in, in 2010. And why is this relevant for us? Well, there are many different applications of graphene. It's impermeable, the thinnest material in nature, very strong, very flexible, uh, nearly transparent material, very good electrical conductor. That's all very nice. But what, what we are interested on as antenna engineers is the following, that graphene has excellent conditions for the propagation of surface plasmon polarity, which is an effect, an effect a, a physical effect that happens at the interface between a dielectric and a metal, right? And all metals, <coughs> all metals uh, can show this uh, um, uh, SPP effect, these plasmonic effects, but at different, at different frequency bands. For instance, uh, gold uh, shows uh, plasmonic effects in the infrared, but graphene, uh, coincidentally, shows these effects in the terahertz range, right? Uh, and why are these effects important? Uh, surface uh, plasma polaritons are slow waves, which means that they change the relationship between between uh, the frequency and the length of an antenna, essentially. And the second is that these uh, uh, plasmons in graphene, they are tunable, which means that you can change the frequency at which they happen. Uh, and this is very important because if you want to do antennas out of these kind of effects, right, uh, you, might, you, you might have tunable antennas, right? So, well, it was theorized <clears throat> more than a decade ago that due to these SPPs, uh, antennas made out of uh, graphene could uh, re resonate in the terahertz band while being one to two orders of magnitude smaller than terahertz metallic antennas. And this is the comparison between this green light and this blue light in this plot on the right. Uh, the, blue, the blue one is on graphene and the green one is on a uh, perfect electrical conductor. And you see that the perfect electrical conductor follows the typical trend of one over the length of the antenna, while the, uh, the graphene case follows a trend which is one over the square root of the length of the antenna. So that's why uh, whenever you look at something like, uh, let's say, an antenna which is 10 micrometers, the graphene antenna is closer to one terahertz, while the metallic antenna, the perfect metallic antenna, is closer to yeah, 20, 20 terahertz. So yeah, that's between one and two orders of magnitude smaller or a lower frequency for the same size or smaller for the same frequency. So the, there's a clear miniaturization potential by using graphene in the terahertz band. So what we did uh, in the past was to take this idea and actually go to CST or you could take FECO or HFSS or any other uh, of these programs and we we simulated an antenna. We implemented an antenna, a very, a very simple dipole with the two legs made of, out of graphene, uh, a voltage to give biasing to the, to the graphene, and then a, a source in the middle, right? And we simulated this, this type of antenna. And for instance, we did different types of tests. We evaluated a graphene antenna by varying the dimensions. So you see the impedance over frequency, uh, 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 real and imaginary. And if you look at the frequencies at which the, at which the imaginary uh, impedance is zero and, and, uh, and the real impedance is low, you, 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 trans, you translate the plot on the left to the plot on the right, which tells you which is the resonance uh, frequency as a function of the dipole length. And you can see that the black one is graphene, the antenna made of graphene, while the yellow one is the, the antenna made of gold. And you see that the, that the predicted uh, trend is actually confirmed in CST, which is that there's a between one and two, or, well, in this case, no, not between one and two orders of magnitude reduction, but there's a very, very significant reduction in the size of the antenna for the same resonance, resonance frequency. So, yes, we confirm by, via simulations that you can have 
a very nice miniaturization in graphene. The second thing that we did is to try to change the the Fermi energy, which is the internal energy of the of the graphene layers, which uh, result in a change in the in the resonant condition of the antenna. As I was saying, the SPPs are tunable. See, so in principle, we would wanted to observe if that actual tunability of the SPPs is actually translating into a tunable antenna. And yes, we change the Fermi energy. You see the plot of the of the impedance uh, as a function of this Fermi energy, and on the right we translate that into resonance condition as a function of this Fermi energy and efficiency as a function of this Fermi energy. So from left to right, you see that the resonance condition uh, moves a lot, right? So it, we start at 1.5 terahertz of resonance frequency and the same antenna with the same size by just changing the voltage, which uh, leads to a change in the Fermi energy, is leading all the way up to a resonance of 3 terahertz. So it's more than 100% of tuning range of this antenna without changing the size of the antenna. And on the other side, on the on the other hand, that also changes the efficiency of the antenna. The problem of this miniaturization is that leads to a much much more more poor efficiency of the antenna. So if you want to have an efficient antenna, you have to go to less miniaturization to a higher chemical potential. But in the end, that showed to uh, that showed to us that these antennas are tunable, and tunability in the end also means switchability. So if you're looking at a fixed frequency, if you tune out the antenna uh, to the, oh, off that frequency, then you are switching off, actually, particularly switching off the, the antenna. So we wanted to, to to see if we can generalize that into, into different designs of different antennas. So seeing that the gain of these antennas or the efficiency of these antennas was small, uh, we wanted to still keep the tunability in frequency, but now give uh, an extra reconfigurability to the to the antenna. And a solution that we found to this problem was to try to have a Yagi antenna where all the elements were graphene. So this was giving us some extra degrees of freedom. And actually, we, we explored very nicely the graphene because the graphene in the driver antennas uh, was changing the actually the frequency of resonance of the, of the entire antenna system while uh, uh, changing the Fermi energy of the reflectors and the directors were act was, was actually tuning on and off the different uh, element, the different parasitic elements so that they become part of the antenna or they do not become part of the antenna. So that means that with this simple uh, this simple scheme, we could have the equivalent to four, to four Yagyud antennas at the same time, but uh, to tunable, right? So you can see that uh, on top right, you have the black, the blue, the green, and the red uh, 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 radiation patterns correspond to different activation of different parts of the antenna, uh, as you can see on the, on the insets. And we also demonstrated that we can also do that at different frequencies. So on the, the, the picture at the bottom shows that we, if we added more reflectors and more, more directors and we activated precisely different of these antennas, we could have the same effect both at 1.5 and 2.3 terahertz, which is not which is not doable without uh, in metallic antennas without adding any other uh, capacitive element or any other element well, that would change the, the shape. And not happy with that, we kept pushing, trying to go to something which would generalize to any frequency and to any state, let's say, to any, not only four directions and two frequencies, but, other, but uh, to, any, to any direction. And pairing that graphene thing with the metasurface uh, concept from, from before, we, well, we were targeting to go towards truly reconfigurable antennas with metasurface, right? So the idea was to, you, to create uh, unit cells made of graphene and other things, but uh, graphene on top, that thanks to this tunability would change the amplitude and phase response of the unit cell uh, uh, over different, over, over different um, uh, conditions so that we could change by only changing the voltage applied to these unit cells to change completely the operation of the matter surface. And essentially, in a way that at the hertz band, it's very hard to do with other components, right? And we, well, essentially, we did this, this design of unit cells, and we started testing different different applications in which this could work, right? So we applied this to beam steering, so we created this simulation of, of 100 unit cells per axis in which unit cells we had 
one uh, one graphene element that could be biased, right? And we applied it to create this uh, metasurface that is able to steer the beam to dif three different frequent, uh, th sorry, three different directions, uh, shown in these three plots. So we showed that this could be could be working. We also proposed to do a similar thing for near field communication. So applying the same uh, unit cell uh, design, but to a different coding to the, of the metasurface, which instead of uh, which instead of steering a, a beam in the in the far field, we could focus uh, energy into the near field, into different parts of the near field, so that by the presence or absence of energy, we could encode one message in different parts of the near field. So we use the same exactly the same the same uh, uh, idea uh, in a metasurface to create this kind of communication uh, channels, right? And I'm over the top of the hour, but uh, let me just very quickly in five minutes go into why these graphene antennas and in the end graphene metasurface were, were very important for us and what was the actual application driver that that uh, was motivating us to work on these graphene antennas. It is on-chip communication. The, the main idea that we had is to use these graphene antennas to put many of them within the chips of a computing system and to communicate within the chips and across the chips of a computing system. So the idea was to integrate these antennas into the chips and communication is actually wireless but happens through the processor packet. So you have to think that the, the computing system is kind of a, yeah, a, a, a metallic cage in which the, all the energy is enclosed and we use the, uh, the antennas to communicate from one side of the computing system to the other side of the computing system without going out of this metallic cage, right? In the end, this is just a wireless network that complements a wired network uh, because the wired network has some problems which are related to rigidity and scalability, which wireless can help to alleviate and to, to actually help increase the speed of, of computing systems. Of course, uh, wireless is not uh, the best in, at everything. It's generally less efficient than, than a wire, and it generally provides a low bandwidth compared to wires in which you can put many wires um, in parallel, right? But it gives you the, the advantages of low latency, which means that from one chip to the other chip, you can go with a few nanoseconds, which is not possible with wires. And the other thing is that it generally broadcasts, but you can radiate from one antenna to all the other antennas at the same time, which is very, very hard to do with wires. And finally, because since you have some global view of the entire network, this gives you some plasticity, some system level flexibility. You can, you can schedule different channels at different frequencies or spatial channels, and that can change the shape of the network at, at, a, at any given time, which is something that, again, you cannot do easily with wires. Okay, so we we investigated different things which are related to the wireless channel, how the different antennas on chip antennas can radiate into this enclosed package, which is uh, a computing system. We also investigated how the thickness and the properties of different materials that uh, 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 appear in these computing packages, like the silicon, the silicon dye, or the aluminum nitride that is generally used for head spreading. We investigated how that would impact to the path loss, for instance, on the top. Uh, on the top figures and the delay spread of the communicate of the on chip communications channel, uh, which is the the the, um, the plot on the bottom, and we investigated and we actually came to the conclusion that we can actually shape the channel again. We can engineer the channel by modifying the dimensions of these materials, which actually that's something that um, that uh, package manufacturers never thought about because they they didn't need to 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 care about too much about the, this dimension and so on. But now that if we want to uh, provide this wireless functionality, well, we can modify and actually uh, use to to our advantage. And and the idea of having graphene antennas was to not and not be happy with a single antenna per chip, but rather have antennas which are much, much, much smaller. So you can start having uh, arrays of antennas. So you can start having something like uh, beams or uh, beam steering or, or energy steering within a, within such an enclosed environment, which you cannot do with metallic antennas because uh, they are too large. And also because we wanted to have multiple channels in frequency. We, if, if these antennas are inherently tunable, we can change the frequency of operation of these antennas whenever we need to go to other channels. So that was the idea, right? To use this, all these properties to have a, a much better uh, wireless communication. And that actually comes to, to the end of my talk in which I just explained uh, the Weblash project, which is a project, a European project that's ending 
uh, next year and in, in which actually we are actually uh, trying to implement and experimentally prove that uh, graphene antennas can work in the terahertz band. And the challenges that uh, we have ahead and that we still have to, to discover and maybe that you want to, to do research on is how to integrate the graphene antennas with the transceiver circuits and the processor cores in such a small environment. How is the wireless channel at terahertz frequencies uh, within a computing packet? Because we did, we did a study at 60 hertz and 120, but we didn't go to the terahertz band. How can we manage the many channels that now become available in frequency in space? And what architecture, architectural aspects in multi-chip architectures will, would be benefiting most of wireless? So these are some of the questions that we make ourselves and that we want to explore in the next five years. So as a conclusion, uh, modern times are bringing an insatiable appetite for bandwidth, requiring the migration to higher frequency bands in wireless networks. And this opens the door to new paradigms like the Internet of Everything, but also brings new challenges at the macro scale that the channel is much more hostile to the, due to the free space path loss blocking and interference. And in micro scale is that we need, uh, we need miniaturized and versatile antennas to actually integrate them into the, to the, to the new applications. But in response to these challenge, the challenges, we have two responses, right? For the micro scale challenges, we have this reconfigurable intelligent surface as, uh, paradigm, which uh, has disruptive implications for for wireless communications and that we try to go one step, be one step beyond the rest with the hypersurface uh, paradigm. And in response to the microscale challenges, we pose that graphene antennas uh, will be a key enabler of these applications thanks to their, their unique miniaturization and their tunability, which allows to have joint frequency and beam switching. And yeah, with much more to say, I uh, wanted to um, thank everyone that has worked with us in this project, the basis of project on reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, the Whiplash project that uh, I'm coordinating with uh, very nice partners over Europe on graphene antennas for communication systems. And finally, I didn't want to finish without telling you that we are hiring, that there's a very new, very exciting project coming up, which is called WINK, in which we are trying to take the idea of graphene antennas in computing systems to the next level, right? How can we do this better? And how can we take that to quantum computing, which is also a very nice disruptive topic that it's up and coming. And that's it. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit late, but uh, I, I love to talk. So if you don't stop me, I will keep going on. No, th thank you. Thank you very much. It was really very lucrative and very interesting talk, actually. A very exciting field of communications coming ahead, actually. It was really nice. We all really enjoyed. Like, uh, most of us actually bring uh, belong from a microwave community where, like, we are closely related with uh, uh, working on uh, meta surfaces and such kind of uh, works related to antennas specifically. So, uh, there are a few uh, questions. Uh, so, if you allow, like, uh, like, can I go ahead with the questions? Of course. That's yeah. Good. So, uh, Professor Mahadevan has questions. So, uh, like uh, the first question he was asking was that, how do you take uh, care due to the interchip communication, like, interference due to interchip communication? So, this was a question by the first question. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, interference sources can be many, right? Uh, the typical interference source that you might think of is an antenna which is outside of your computing system is actually radiating into the computing system, but that one we actually generally consider that that doesn't happen because we are enclosed in a metallic uh, enclosure. So things from the outside will not come in, right? The second source of interference could be from the actual digital circuits that are switching within the processor, right? But generally this clock is one gigahertz. So it's very far from the hundreds of gigahertz of terahertz that uh, we are envisaging this communication to happen. So even if we pick the harmonics and all that, and there's some crosstalk, it's going to be hard to envisage a lot of noise coming into the terahertz band. And finally, how do we take care of the actual interference happening between the different chips, right? That's, yeah, that's part of our job as engineers at the, at the link layer of the protocol stack. Uh, what we do is to try to envisage like Wi-Fi, right? Uh, you have several devices that want to communicate. So there's this MAC protocol, the medium access control protocol, which tells you who speaks at a given time so that there's no interference. So what we will do is that whenever two devices or two chips want to communicate at the same time, one will start communicating, the other will shut up for a while, right? And when the first chip has finished, the other one will start, right? And there's a 
there's a there's a, a full a full uh, topic of research how to make these protocols the way in a way that they are fair they don't incur into latency they don't incur into reduction of throughput and so on so we will assume that we can switch off the antennas at some point if we want of the, we switch off the transmitters if we don't want to transmit and that the interference will be reduced due to that, right? Other ways would be by, by using different frequencies. Now that we have graphene antennas, so you tune two, two different antennas at two different frequencies to have two parallel frequencies of, of communication or something that we're exploring. It's a bit more prospective, but we are still exploring is if we can have spatial channels, right? Can we have directive antennas within those environments, even if that's a very enclosed environment? Can we have directive antennas so that the energy is not reaching uh, to all the parts of the system? And can we make that in a way such that you can have two channels happening at the same time? So, yeah, as I say, there's, yeah, we take into account the source of interference and we try to avoid them as much as possible. Thank you for your excellent response for that question. Yeah, that's so see the the way it needs to be done and the sequencing really required for communicating with various chips is a very big job as you already pointed out. So th that is one big challenge. I think it's all posed to the youngsters for, for them to do research on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Professor Mahadevan, you have any more questions or any comments? Yeah, this, this, this is a very new area which has really come up and uh, it has come on specifically I'm uh, very much uh, impressed by the uh, so this uh, what is that called the hypersurface which he has really mm -hmm. pointed out it was really a, a big challenging task which has to come up and the other one anyway this RIS uh, re, the reflecting intelligent surface is coming up in some way but it is uh, not really caught the market see it is was still in research stage but it has a lot of uh, 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 application specifically for indoor it is extremely useful in indoor in a community in a conference room or in a, a, either a, a similar uh, such a situation in a big conference etc so it's a very big but it has to come to a real commercial product because it is still in research stage so these are two things and the other very impressive ones are the graphene antennas which you really pointed out and how we can do the only thing is i'm surprised as to how we are going to really array them because presently we may use it like a reflector array mm -hmm. but if you really want to array like a normal antenna and uh, do it how is it been? so that is also another area which we need to explore so thank you so much for bringing out and opening up a lot of areas of research mm -hmm. on this particular area thank you so much i'm i'm happy to know that i'm also a, a alumni of iit karakpur so Thanks. so much interested in all the topics and the excellent work which the a student group there is doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mahadevan. Uh, so, Dr. Sir, there is one small uh, query that I have. So, if you could go in slide number 59. Yeah, uh, indeed. Yeah, so, there was one small thing, sir. Uh, yeah, so here, uh, this chemical potential, it is the same potential like how you are controlling the chemical potential. It is using the biasings, uh, like it is using biasing for external dc biasing or it's a different uh, using some chemical uh, uh, reaction no, 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 it's, it's what you're saying yeah essentially we use the same name for chemical potential is the same name for us that fermi energy okay and in the end there are several ways that you can modify the chemical potential slash fermi energy mm -hmm. one of them is applying uh, a dc biasing so yeah in our case we we just uh, relate fermi energy to voltage right yeah. And the second qu question is a continuation of it. So when we talk about normally yes. microwave circuits, so we have a, uh, in case of DC biasing, we have a DC biasing network or so-called bias T that we use normally. So it is, uh, is it the same uh, kind of arrangement that we have to design or like uh, it will be a kind of uh, uh, like a different kind of arrangement uh, for the DC biasing case? So this DC biasing network that you use, what, what is it for? Uh, is it the same like in microwave circuit we use DC biasing network so there is just something known as bias T concept of bias T so we cannot uh, normally connect a DC circuit directly uh, to a DC biasing so there is a certain resistance and uh, capacitance and LC network basically a simple LC network that we use okay. to design for biasing our amplifiers microwave amplifiers or uh, any kind of antenna so is it the same thing or like a different kind of arrangement? Like well, it's, just it's gonna be it's gonna be similar, right? In the end, mm -hmm. what you need to do is to bring a DC voltage to a place close to the graphene patch, right? 
in a way that the wire uh, does not create uh, uh, an RF impairment mm -hmm. to the actual unit cell. In this case, you would have the unit cell with the graphene on top, right? Mm -hmm. And the biasing would come probably from a from a nano wire coming from below, right? So you need to do it in a way that there's no that that wire is not going to interfere with the mm -hmm. with the RF uh, response of the of the unit cell. So I'm not sure I know the concept that you're t telling me about, but uh, I think it's going to be similar. <laughs> you have you're going to have a network of wires that are going to go get close to the each of the unit cells, and that they have to provide the, the required voltage. Thank you. Thank you very much for this query. So any more questions? Uh, I guess that's uh, fine from everyone's side. So thank you very much. Thank you very much once again for giving your time, actually valuable time for us to uh, have uh, this wonderful session. And also it was like more of an interactive session because Professor Mahadevan was also there. We had also a few queries like going around and it was, it was, it was really a nice session actually going on and on. Thank you very much. Doctor, thank you very I'm much. I'm very happy. I'm very happy that you liked it anytime. So again, just before leaving, uh, we're hiring. So if you're interested in working with us in Barcelona in these topics, uh, I'll be happy to. So to so as a, as a microwave engineer, like, can we uh, uh, like apply for this uh, areas of work? Yes, indeed. So the, the school, yeah, the scholarship on wireless and chip communication is working. Uh, the name is your post, I would say that goes from anything from antenna design, channel modeling, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, package, uh, microwave package design, um, uh, signal processing, anything on those on those areas is going to be very helpful because you're doing a lot of, sure. of channel modeling, this antenna design, antenna, uh, antenna array design within the chips. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a lot of work to do. On the at the bottom, let's say. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. It's more of a co collaborative work that, like most of us, we used to do, isn't it? The collaborative yeah. work, like all coming together. Thank yeah. you, thank you very much once again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we hope uh, we would be hosting uh, Dr. Segil once again, uh, physical mode. In physical mode, we hope to meet you soon, <laughs> like once uh, the <laughs> Corona pandemic is over, and like yeah. we could have meet some in common conference or all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, and do let us know whenever you come to India. We will be more than happy to have you in our uh, like campus, of course, and to see like of what the works we used to do in our campus and have a collaboration kind of work. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Looking forward. Thanks so much. Thank you all. So, thank you. Such a very important session for the students committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, by the way. It was a very nice opportunity to, to talk about this.